Hey everybody, I'm live. It's John Hope Bryant, founder, chairman, and chief executive officer of Operation Hope, the nation's first ever national nonprofit financial services network for the poor, the underserved, and the struggling middle class or the teetering class, folks with too much month at the end of their money. I'm also chairman and CEO of Bryant Group Ventures, but that's less important today. That's actually important at the end of the story when talking about uh, what I've done with the, God, the gift that God, the gifts that God have given me. But when you come on live, I want you to make sure you put your questions here at the bottom. And if I don't get you while we're on live, uh, I will come back because this is one of the most important videos uh, that I will ever do. Uh, I'm going to tell you some stories about things you've never heard uh, before. I'm going to tell you a story that 99% of the people on uh, the planet uh, have never heard before, certainly in the United States of America. It's American history uh, that defined everything, and no one told it. It's not, not history books. Uh, it's not being taught in our schools. Uh, it's not being taught by our political leaders or our social scientists. It's not in our, in our cultural or historic uh, DNA. And so we're lost, and we don't know why. We're lost, uh, many of us, and we don't know why. Why is there a black underclass? People don't know why. They assume it's just racism and discrimination. That's not true. That is part of the issue, yes. But we're not the only people who are discriminated against in the world. Jews have been discriminated against. Latinos and Hispanics have been discriminated against. Uh, I mean, if you go to Japan, the light Japanese are in the, running the, the country, and the dark Japanese are out in the prefectures. Uh, they're farmers. They, have a, they make a, a life for themselves. You go to Mexico, you've got the Spaniards, the Spaniards that are inside of Mexico with a lighter skin. You've got the mestizo, those who are of mixed race, who are really um, part of what many call the other peasant class. I don't agree with that, but some, some people call them that. Those are the ones coming over the border trying to get to, to America for a better economic way of life. Uh, you go to any part of the world and you'll find people who have been discriminated against. Uh, that's not the primary reason why blacks have not been successful in America. It's a contributing factor. Uh, clearly, slavery, built a economy with fr for free, was a, was, a, was a contributing factor, a huge factor. But that's not enough in and of itself. Uh, they, we're not the only people who were slaved, uh, 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 enslaved. Uh, we're the only folks who were enslaved on American land. So then what is the issue? What, what, what is the reason why there's a black underclass um, that uh, just seems to be almost permanent? It's not permanent. But why is it? Let me explain to you Ferguson, Missouri. I'm going to explain to you Baltimore during the riots. I'm going to explain to you Watts during the riots and South Central LA during the riots. I'm going to explain to you uh, all of the drama and trauma that we can't seem to get our hands around and it's all locked in a little piece of history that only happened with regard to us, but it ties to the whole American fabric and, it's, and getting this truth right has a lot to do with our strategy going forward. So here's a drop the mic moment. You ready? And I see a lot of folks are, uh, signing in, David Brewer, and uh, hey, David, and Trevor, and uh, Be uh, Beth, and uh, Minus, and uh, Jason, and a other bunch of folks are signing in. So, let so let's have this conversation. This is a story that no one's ever told you. It's the Freedmen's Bank story. It started with President Abraham Lincoln, March 3rd, 1865. On that day, he sat down at his desk, and he signed a piece of legislation. It was called the Freedmen's Bureau Act. And the Freedmen's Bureau Act created the Freedmen's Bank. And the Freedmen's Bank's mission was to teach free slaves about money. Boom. <laughs> Call it modern day financial literacy. Wait, wait a minute now, wait a minute. You say the most important thing that, 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 that arguably the best president we've ever had uh, during a transformational time in America's history, the most important thing that he thought he could do after slavery, after the Emancipation Proclamation, I'm sorry, after slavery, after the Civil War, after the conclusion of the Civil War, after the Emancipation uh, Proclamation, the most important thing that he thought he could do as President of the United States of America was to, was to create a bank to teach free slaves about money and to promote savings and to give them access to the free enterprise system? Really? Yes. But it gets deeper than that. Let's go back three months before this. Uh, and Skip Gates, I want to give Professor Skip Gates some love here and give him credit, properly proper credit, for pointing me in this direction. Two months before the Freedmen's Bank, January 1865, uh, Secretary of War Stanton, which one of Lincoln's cabinet members, and uh, General Sherman, I believe that was his name, uh, they went to uh, Savannah, Georgia. Now, Atlanta had been burned to the ground, the march to the sea. Uh, they, uh, the, the Union Army had really decided to just really 
psychologically damaged the Confederate Army by burning uh, everything to the sea. It worked, and the Army gave up. But what they didn't burn was Savannah because of its beautiful home. So they met there with 20 former ministers and said, what do you want after slavery? What do you want after the Civil War? Did they say, I want a government program? No. Do I want social services? We need them. But no. Do you want an apology? Not really. Um, do you want, uh, you want reparations? Was it even brought up? No. What do you want? I want land, they said. Give me land. Let me do for myself. So they, uh, they allocated now 400,000 acres from North Carolina down the uh, coast, down the eastern coast, along the beach, 30 miles from the waterfront, all the way down the eastern coast to what you now call Miami, Florida. All of that land was freedmen's land. And uh, you, you know, it'll make sense to you in a moment. Now, there was no internet, there was no email, there was no Twitter, there's no Facebook mentions back then, there's no fax machines, nothing, right? So how'd they get the word out? Somehow we got the word out that this land was available. And next month, a thousand former slaves took possession of this land, uh, made it their own, and started working it. And they worked, and by the way, this was crappy land by agricultural standards. These were an agricultural age back then. So if you put seeds in the ground on your seafront property uh, in 1865, you wake up in the morning and your crop is in... <laughs> Turks and Caicos, because the ocean is taking it away. But we didn't complain about it, right? We didn't uh, argue about it that it was. We just got busy doing the best we can with what we had. We've been doing so much with so little for so long, we can almost do anything with nothing, which means we're enterprising and we have an industrious behavior and mentality when given a shot. So, uh, so, so, so the general was so impressed by the industriousness of these former slaves, one month after allocating the property, he said, give them a mule which wasn't a disrespect, it was a sign of immense uh, uh, respect and gratitude. It's like saying today to a farmer, give them, invest with them a tractor. Uh, well, you might know this story is 40 acres and a mule. <laughs> but that's not the story I'm bringing to you, that's just the background. So uh, January, you had Field Action 15, which was done in the field as a uh, military action by one of Lincoln's generals. So it had the act of law, uh, the effect of law, but it did not have the effect of a permanent law because Congress hadn't codified it. Get to that in a second. We'll see how long we can get, how much we can get through in three more minutes. And then uh, I'm going to do this in two parts. So then uh, the next month, the blacks take the take the land and work hard and are given a mule. The next month, Lincoln creates a bank to promote savings, to teach you about the language of money and financial literacy, and to give you access to capital. Boom! For what purpose? To finance your land, so you could become free through self-determination. The new the definition of freedom is. Is, is, is modern definition of freedom, I believe, today is self-determination. We'll talk in another video about democracy and how that was so important in the 20th century. That was codified through the right to vote. That was empowerment. And how in the 21st century, it's really an economic age and it's codified through financial literacy and understanding the economy and money, which I'm getting to in a moment. So, uh, so what happened? Lincoln creates this bank and the next month he gets killed. I'm sorry, he was assassinated. So January, Field Action 15, February, the mule, uh, March, the bank, uh, April, he, uh, he gets assassinated, April 9th. And then a, a, a Southern segregationist, worst president we've ever had, took over from Lincoln, because Lincoln was trying to rich back to the South by having, having a Southern segregationist on his, on his cabinet, because he thought he wouldn't get killed after the uh, Civil War. He'd get killed during the Civil War, so he thought that this guy would be his bridge. Well, this guy was his terror, came in and tried to reverse everything Lincoln did. The Republican Congress, which means you can't put everybody into a boat now, Lincoln was also a Republican, and no, I'm not making a political statement. <laughs> um, uh, I'm just saying you can't just, you can't just group think anybody, because back in that day, Republicans were for uh, blacks and were for emancipation. So the Congress said to this Southern segregationist guy, no, we're not going to turn, uh, turn away what Lincoln did. We support him. So the guy uh, canceled the things he could, which was Field Action 15. He put all the federal troops, so the 400,000 acres went away put all the federal troops out of the South and told Southern governors, I can't re re replace what Lincoln's done. I can't remove it, but I can ignore it. Do as you like. So another video at another time. That's where Rough Riders came from. That's where the Klan came from. Basically, go get your land back, right? Because when the sun goes down and the lights, there's no street lights, it's going to be on and popping. It was about, it was economics, reclaim your land. Now, Frederick Douglass, the Colin Powell of that day, had a stellar reputation. Who was a businessman, I might say. You know him as, a, 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 as, an, as an emancipator and as somebody who was, a, who was an abolitionist. But he owned land. He owned lots of land. He owned businesses in Baltimore. He went to go run the bank. Another drop the mic moment. Because he thought it was so important. 
And uh, it was too late. The bank had been, had been gained by political operatives in the new president's cabinet. But he tried. He put $10,000 of his own money in this bank. Think $20 million today, which means he wasn't broke. <laughs> Uh, Fr Frederick Douglass was, was rolling, right? He, he understood free enterprise, put $10,000 of his own money in the bank. It failed on his watch. 73,000 former slaves were depositors, $52 million in deposits. That would be $100 billion in deposits today. Making one of the 25 top banks in America without another deposit. So these were not lazy people. These were not these, former slaves proved even when their government disrespected them, even when people gave them no respect and no regard, even when people dismissed them, they proved that they could do something for themselves. They could square up the circle in their own lives. And uh, but that wasn't enough. And when the bank failed, uh, and Frederick Douglass asked for the bank to be closed because it was just. He was afraid more damage would be done. He, he said the failure of this bank did more to set free slaves in America back than 10 more years of slavery. And now you pop your fingers 100 years. And here comes Dr. King uh, and my friend, Ambassador Andrew Young, who I'm with here in South Africa, with the Poor People's Campaign. I'll do another video on this, just on this. In 1968, uh, with a mission, uh, what did Dr. King say? Uh, uh, in a capitalist country, you cannot... You cannot legislate goodness. You cannot pass a law to force someone to respect you. The only way to social justice in a capitalist country is economics and ownership. That was Dr. King in 1968. And then he gets killed April 4th, 1968, same month as Lincoln, 100 years later, in Memphis, Tennessee. So what's my message? We never got the memo, folks. There's a memo on free enterprise and capitalism. There's a memo on creating jobs. There's a memo on money. There's a memo on wealth creation, and we never got the memo. We're not dumb and we're not stupid. It's what we don't know that we don't know that's killing us, but we think we know. And the legacy of this is 151 years after the Freedmen's Bank failure, and none of us even know the history, right? We're the only race of people, black Americans, who created a political power, power base before we created an economic one. Hello. The only nation, only group of people in the world who created a political power base before an economic one. And I'm not jamming us up for doing it. We did the best we could with what we had, but it is backwards. Uh, and so wh that's why I wrote the book, How the Poor Can Save Capitalism, to, to, to deliver part of that memo. That's why the work of Operation Hope is so important. That's why the work of Hope Inside and Hope Business in the Box Academies and our internship initiative and all the work we're doing to create financial capability in communities so that you could do for yourself. What did Shimon Peres tell me when I was in Jordan, Shimon Peres of Israel, and I was in Jordan? He said, John, people are going to criticize you for your work, but when they do, you tell them this. Even if you want to distribute money like a socialist, you've got to first collect money like a capitalist. So we have not been taught how to collect money like a capitalist. We never got the memo on free enterprise and capitalism. And as a result of that, you've got basically, Ferguson is basically no jobs. What did Van Jones say? The best way to stop a bullet is a job. So I'm stopping now. It's 13 minutes. And this, I think I'm going to do this in sections. But I want to, I've never said this publicly. And we, by the way, work, we work with Secretary of, of the Treasury, Jack Lew, uh, because the, the headquarters of this bank was across the street from the Treasury Department on the White House campus at what was called the U.S. Treasury Annex Building. And I went to Secretary Lew and said, you know, uh, you cannot possibly tell me that uh, the Treasury Annex Building is a sexier name than the Freedmen's Bank Building. How about we honor former slaves and rename that bank building the Freedmen's Bank Building? And, and people said I was crazy, but, you know, Dr. Dr. Dorothy Hyde said, John, you're a dreamer with a shovel in your hands. And I, I never gave up, and I worked with the mayors at the, at the Treasury Department, the mayors Moore Garrity, and I worked with uh, Wale uh, at, uh, at the Treasury Department, now at the White House, and I worked with all these folks, Melissa Corday and all these people there, and really kept, never gave up. And, and frankly, after about 10 months, the Secretary of the Treasury said, yes, we'll do it. So, this, so, so as you're watching this video, you can go Google now the Freedmen's Bank building, you can go see it. It's right across from the White House. It is the only uh, one of two buildings on the White House campus that, whose name has ever been changed. Uh, one of them encouraged by a private citizen, the guy you're looking at now, but it was done, uh, thank God, by Secretary Lou. I didn't do it. He did it. And I'm, I think nothing more aspirational has been done by Secretary of the Treasury since Alexander Hamilton. So thank you, John, uh, Secretary Lou, and thank you, Americans, for believing uh, the, in big dreams. And thank you for allowing me to do this video that's the longest I've ever done, but it's the most important one I've ever done because it is our shared history, and history is happening right now. Let's step in it. It's a new movement of civil rights. Let's build on civil rights and create an economy for all. Love you. God bless, and I'll answer the questions uh, post. Peace and light.